number 7, Romans chapter number 7, continuing on with the theme for this month on Christian liberty. Uh, last week, we talked about the two covenants from the book of Galatians, and then the two husbands from uh, 1 Corinthians. And tonight we're going to talk about the two laws. And this morning I introduced a, a subject, a topic on the perfect law of liberty. And it is a law, the gospel is a law because it is something set and sure. It is secure by the promise of God. And, uh, and so... Uh, the Apostle Paul then addresses this idea of two laws. Uh, we find the, the phrase uh, that we're going to focus on tonight occurs uh, three times here in the book of Romans, twice in chapter 7, once in chapter 8. And the phrase is the law of sin. And then, of course, there's another law. Uh, the, the law of God after the inward man. But follow along, I'll begin reading in verse number 21. We will back up and look at some more of these verses. But notice in verse number 21, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. We find the phrase, the law of sin, in verse number 23, another law in, war, in my members, warring against the law of mine, bringing me in subjection into captivity to the law of sin. Verse 25, but with the flesh, uh, the law of sin. And then in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There are, there are truly fathomless depths to explore in the book of Romans. What seems like uh, easy, uh, on the face value, uh, just you know, cursory overview statements are really uh, just the tip of an iceberg or uh, the opening of a well which we have yet to find the bottom of. Just in what we were just reading, the idea that, that God sent His Son Jesus Christ to die for our sins in eight, chapter 8 and verse number 3, that He doing that condemned sin in the flesh, think about verse number four, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The righteousness which is found in the law fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. There is danger, always danger, in reading one verse of Scripture, one phrase out of a verse of Scripture, 
in not getting a broad enough view. If all you did was read uh, the last verse of chapter 7, you might come away with a fatalistic view of the struggle between the flesh and the spirit, as if he's saying, oh well, you know, this is a battle, oh well, nothing I can do about it, oh well, you know, I'm going to continue just to do wrong with the flesh, but right in my heart or in my mind. And when you continue reading, instead of letting the chapter division interrupt your thought, you'll find he is not saying that at all. Because he goes on to say that right now, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And, and what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God accomplished by sending his Son to die on the cross of Calvary for us, that the righteousness revealed in the law might, be, might play itself out and reveal itself in our life if we walk in the Spirit. That does not mean that we can ignore the battle of the flesh and the Spirit, but it's really a struggle between two laws, two distinct forces. We, we would take time to go back and look at the entirety of chapter 7 and really back into chapter number 6, you'd find that the Apostle Paul gives more time to this discussion. In the beginning of chapter 7, it talks about uh, what we dealt with last week, the husband, a uh, woman which is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. Uh, and then a, a continuation of that, meaning he's still talking about the same thing. The law of the, the, the two, excuse me, the, law, the, the two laws, the two covenants, the two husbands. These are all the same discussion with a different uh, illustration. And so Paul then says in verse number six, but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, think about this, the commandment of God, the law of God came, it was ordained to bring life. How? By pointing us to Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So God intended the law to bring us life, not through the keeping of the law, but the revelation of the law. So the law, uh, the commandment which was ordained to life, I found, Paul said, I found it to be unto death. In other words, it condemned me. It caused me to understand my condition in sin. And verse 11, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me. In what way did the law, did, does he mean that the law deceived him, or excuse me, that sin deceived him taking occasion by the commandment. Because sin, taking occasion by the commandment, tries to say, well, then there is no hope. 
There is no point. There is no way of salvation. You might as well give up because uh, there, there is no way out. And so sin, taking occasion by the commandments, slew the apostle Paul. Wherefore, he says in verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was that which is good made, was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. What I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. In what way? Well, you validate the law when it condemns sin and you see yourself as a sinner. You validate the law, that the law is right. What God said is true. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then he says in verse 17, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For a will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And he introduces this truth of two laws. Father, we've read extensive passage, an extensive passage of Scripture tonight. We pray you'll bless the reading of it. Open our understanding that we might get what is needful for us, helpful for us, beneficial to us, that we might learn to walk in the Spirit, that we might not yield ourselves as as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. God, that we might find the, the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. There are two distinct forces at play uh, in the life of the Christian. Verse number 15 describes it when he says, that which I do, I allow not. For what, I, uh, for what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. He's describing the fact that we still uh, commit sin, uh, though there are some who might say, well, I don't realize that big of a struggle. And I'd say to that, one of two things is true. If there is no struggle... Either, number one, it's because there is no spiritual life, as, as Brother Matt was talking about in our corporate Bible reading tonight. He uh, gave a good introduction for the Bible message tonight, by the way. And, uh, and I was just uh, saying, okay, stop there, please. Don't you go any farther, and I'm going to have to, you know, uh, truncate the sermon tonight. But what he did, he just got right up to it. And so... This, uh, this deadness, uh, spiritual deadness, there is no struggle between right and wrong, between holiness and, and godlessness in a dead man. The other case might be that as we uh, further our, uh, deepen our walk in the spirit, we might find that that struggle lessens. It doesn't go away, but it lessens. And, uh, and sometimes we are still guilty of qualifying sin. In other words, gauging sin based on our critique of what is a worse sin. And so, to illustrate, we might judge someone who struggles with immoral things as greater sinners than those who struggle with pride or covetousness. And so we might think ourselves farther along when all we do is struggle in our spirit to maintain a right attitude toward others. <clears throat> and so I, 
One of the things that I pray on a very regular basis, multiple times throughout the week, I like to, I think it's a good thing to pray scripture. Amen. Include God's word in our prayer. One of the things I pray regularly is Acts 24, 16. To exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. To not even think negative thoughts about anyone else. is You say, well, that's a high standard. But it is the standard by which we ought to gauge ourselves if we're trying to if we're, not, if we're not careful, we begin to justify ourselves and say, well, you know, we're not like some who struggle with immoral things or, or we're not so, like some who struggle uh, with indecent things or like some who struggle uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, honesty or dishonesty, if you want to say it that way. But we're struggling with attitudes toward others and we're struggling with pride and we're struggling with things that are an offense to a holy God. But the farther along our walk, it, it is true. Uh, as we, because it must be true. You say, well, can we, can we get all the way there? We will when we see Jesus Christ. But I'm saying to you, we can get closer than we are, and it must be so, or else the Bible command to mortify the flesh would be wasted if it's not possible to mortify the flesh. If it's not possible to die to self, then God wasted space in the Bible commanding us to do so. So it must be possible. It must be that it is available to us to uh, walk in the Spirit. And so there are these two distinct forces. Uh, the moral desire... Uh, to obey the law of God, which the Bible says, as we just read, is holy and just and good. And then there is the law of sin in our members. And uh, everyone is, is uh, bound to admit the existence of this reality. However, we might differ in the way we might explain it. We might define it by using different words, different terms, but it's still the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And these two things, side by side in the same person, is the struggle of the child of God. Again, there is no struggle in the dead man, the spiritually dead man. But notice as Paul describes in his language in verse number 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It's not as if there is not an answer to that because the answer is in the next verse. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so these two principles... Uh, the uh, old man and the new man, the uh, fleshly nature and the uh, one that walks after the Spirit are in opposition to one another within the same man. And so it is a fight, it is a struggle. Uh, and, you know, the, the lost man is in absolute submission to the flesh. He's absolutely given over to it. He might, yes, have some things that are tied to the creative work of God. There is in him still a, uh, a, a, uh, an image of the living God, but it is damaged, it is, it is uh, hindered, it is uh, the conscience of man is not uh, so active, though even a lost man can have a sense of right and wrong, though he doesn't even know where it comes from. But it is not helpful to him because he has nothing to do battle with the flesh with. He has no, no strength, no forces, no soldiers, no power over the flesh without submitting them, himself to 
the will of God. And so the Bible describes here a state, if you want to call it this, a state of unconscious sin. By that I do not mean to imply that man doesn't know when he does wrong. The Bible talks about uh, the fact that man hides himself, man tries to cover his sinfulness because even in his lost state, there's a shame that goes along with sin. I realize that in the culture we live in, that shame is categorically being removed or whittled away at to where people no longer are ashamed as they used to be. There used to be a moral conscience to our nation uh, that uh, went beyond the bounds of the church doors. And that, in large part, has been removed. But notice what Paul described here. He said that before the law came, he was dead. Without the law, he said, sin was dead. He felt like he was alive. And so this state of unconscious sin, uh, a, an unawareness not of the fact of sin, but of the nature of sin, a lack of, of understanding about the consequences of sin, though consequences of sin will only get you so far. And so the soul was dead, not alive, in trespasses and sin. No moral struggle against it. Still, uh, though sin is not a matter of conscience, it is still sin. Say, well, I didn't think it was sin. That doesn't change the fact of sin. Those who think it's all right to sin does not mean that there's no consequences for their sin. So sin is sin just the same. It's a violation of that which God put in us, the conscience, the, the uh, awareness, the, uh, the uh, stamp or the image of God uh, in us. It's a violation of that. It's a violation of the design of what we uh, uh, observe around us, uh, that there's a right way to do things. There, there is... I don't buy into there's a divine spark in every man. Uh, But if you mean by that, there is the image of God in man, then I agree with that. So the body is designed as a dwelling place of the soul. When we are yet in our sin before salvation, uh, the spirit, the, the conduit between God and man is dead to where we do not understand nor receive nor perceive the things of the Spirit. Not until uh, the uh, opportunity comes for God to quicken the Spirit. There are those who argue back and forth whether or not you have to be saved first before that happens. And, uh, And it's a straw man. It's an argument that does not contain any weight. Why? Because the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And so the Bible simply declares it this way, to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. And so it is not that you must be converted in order to understand but rather you accept by faith what God has said and then you are converted and brought to spiritual life. This idea of the unconscious uh, condition of a lost man does not mean that he is unaware that there is a God. Romans chapter 1 declares that to us when it says that that which may be known of God, even his eternal power and Godhead, are clearly seen in the things which are made. <clears throat> so that man is what? Without excuse. And so even unregenerate man recognizes there is right and wrong. 
there is good and bad. There is uh, holiness and ungodliness. And, uh, and so this unregenerate state is a condition of, uh, of a, a lack of awareness, if we can say it this way, of the, the consequences and depth of sin. Until the law comes and sin revives and the man sees it and realizes that he is spiritually dead. Not only that, because of that, it, there, it is a state of a false life. Paul said, before the law came, I was alive. But was he really spiritually alive? The answer is no. But what lost man doesn't think that he is his own master? What lost man doesn't think that he is doing what he wants? What lost man doesn't think that he is, he is uh, uh, definitively alive and, and able to make his choices and do as he wishes? They all think that until the law comes. That's why when you share Christ with someone very often, it is the law that does the work. Because man thinks, well, I'm a, basically a good person. I've never done anything drastically wrong. And all you need to do is start pulling out the commandments of God and say, oh, have you ever coveted something? Have you ever borne false witness? Have you ever uh, been deceitful and, and uh, taken that which is not uh, yours to take, have you? And, uh, and, and, and the truth is, we don't get very far into that list if we have honesty uh, about ourselves before we realize that the law condemns us. We thought we were alive, but it was a false notion of life. Paul said, I was alive without the law once because he had no understanding of the law of God's word. In, in our flesh, we think that we are um, uh, living our own life. And so he, the lost man, enjoys the pleasure of life. He enjoys business of life. And, uh, but it is a false life. It is a, not the life of a moral, intelligent being. It is not a life aware of the fact that there is something beyond uh, these four score and ten it's a false sense of being alive. So I'd say that brings us to this conflict between the flesh and the spirit. In the first stage of man's life, he is dead in trespasses and sins. But when salvation comes through God's word, then there is spiritual life. There is a, an understanding of God's commandment. When the commandment came, the law of God flashed on the conscience of, of Paul and he recognized that he was a sinner, which caused him to understand that he was truly spiritually dead. And so is the law sin? God forbid Paul said, no, the law is, was not my enemy. The law, the law was against me in that I was a sinner. But it was my friend in that it pointed out the sin. Uh, I had not known sin except the law had told me that I was a sinner. And so the commandment came, which brought the awareness of spiritual death was it bad? No. Was that which is good? Did it, was it made death to me? No. But so that sin might become exceeding sinful. <clears throat> Why does lost man need sin to become exceeding sinful? Because until it does, he will assume that he is okay. He'll assume that he is somehow on a, an acceptable path. And so sin uh, awakens in the consciousness of man when God's law enters in. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> it is not just, well, as I said this morning, 
as a man tried to describe to me, he says, well, this is my truth. It might not be your truth. It might not be somebody else's truth, but it's my truth. But there is only one truth, that is the truth of God's word. And so when the law enters, sin becomes exceeding sinful. We become aware that it's not just my idea or my choice. Sin is a transgression of the law of God. And so what is the result of that? The understanding of sin's wrongfulness. Uh, It is, Paul said that, Uh, If uh, he said, uh, I I find that in me dwelleth no good thing. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That comes as an awareness from the law of God. So the feeling of slavery then, the realization of coming to the, to the understanding that we have not been doing what we wanted to do, but rather we've been doing what we were bound to do, bound by the law of sin and of death. Say, what's the answer to the law of sin and death? Chapter 8 gives you that, that Jesus Christ came so that the righteousness of the law might be revealed in us while we walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. And so there's this characteristic struggle that, that comes within that, the man that is converted. Think about this inward conflict. You know, we're familiar in life with conflict. We see conflict everywhere. We see conflict in nature, uh, animals. People think, oh, you know, uh, man, those that, that accept evolution as their baseline, they say, oh, man is the only animal that doesn't have a conscience. Listen, uh, that person has never gone out and seen what goes on with animals. And uh, uh, just recently I had a, an experience with that when something decided to tunnel under. You know, it wasn't just the, you know, the, the uh, uh, Hogan's heroes that, you know, Gestapo 13 that tunneled under, amen? Somebody tunneled under, uh, something tunneled under my chicken coop recently, and I just moved some young birds out there that I had, I had hatched and, and raised and, and was now ready to put them out in an area of the chicken coop, and the next day I go out there, and there's a little pile of feathers and no small chickens. There was a hole where it tunneled under, and, uh, and so after a little bit of time and effort, um, the culprit was apprehended. It was a uh, racing cat, those black cats with two white stripes down them. And, uh, and so, yeah, and, and so he fought the law and the law won. Uh, but anyway, um, and so, but I went out yesterday and, and uh, something that I had been started to fill a hole in, something's trying to redig the hole. I don't know what it is. I've put out another trap and live uh, and a trail cam, and and we'll see what happens this time. Amen. Uh, but uh, but somebody that says, "Oh, animals are just they're, they're just peaceful, uh, wonderful things," has never been out and observe, observed what animals do. And the truth of the matter is that. Man is the only one with a conscience, not the only one without a conscience. And man is no just higher evolved animal. We are made in the image of God. And so this inward conflict that, uh, that we experience, you see it in the area of politics. The, there was an assassination t- attempt yesterday on pre uh, um, President, former President Donald Trump, and uh, boy, you just think, uh, you know, one inch to the right, and we're having a whole different conversation, and, uh, you know, there's, there needs to be an awareness of the brevity of life, and, uh, and so there's conflict all around us in the area of politics, there's conflict all around us in the area of business, 
There's conflict all around us in society uh, over lifestyle choices, they call it, but it is sinful choices. There's always competing interests, desires, wills at play. But this conflict is not just outside around us. This conflict is in us. Notice what Paul said. This law is warring in my members. It is an internal conflict. Notice what he says, this law of sin, uh, how it affects him. Notice he says uh, in verse number, um, let's begin back in verse number uh, 15. For that which I do, I allow not, and what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that it is good. In other words, every time you sin, you validate God's law. And so, if then, in verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will... To want to, to will, is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's the spirit, right? That's the spirit that has been quickened and made alive as we read together earlier. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. This battle is an internal battle. It prevents, notice what it does. It prevents Paul, it prevents the Christian from arriving at the standard of excellence which is presented before him in the Word of God. It hinders you from being all that God wants you to be because when you would do good, the flesh raises itself up. Being without conflict is sometimes one of the most dangerous conditions to be in. When, it, when are our defenses, whether nationally or personally, when are they at their lowest? Very often when we are at peace, when we're unaware of the enemy. And so when we decide that we're going to do what's right, when we want to do what is good, what is Bible, what is biblical and holy and godly, there's another law that raises up the law of sin in our members that, that Paul described as a battle within himself that often kept him from doing all the good that he would. Think about it this way. It prevents us from doing all the good that we want to do and it keeps us from having victory over all the evil that we want to have. It hinders, it says, he said it this way, so that I cannot do the things that I would. He is desire to be conformed to the law of God is thwarted, it is undermined by the inclinations of the flesh. You say, well, is there no answer, or no remedy? yes. Through Christ, we can find the strength to mortify the flesh, to put it to death, to learn to say no to our, uh, our, our, uh, the, the law of sin in our members. So this law in our members prevents us from rising to the standard of, of excellence that is presented to us in the Word of God. It hinders the fullest development of our spiritual life. Every Christian 
has the outline in his life of obedience to Christ. Jesus Christ, by that I mean this, that Jesus Christ sets the pattern for every one of us. But the law of sin hinders us from following that pattern as best we could. Every Christian, just as, uh, as we are born into God's family, we receive light of the gospel, we become the child of God, we are admitted into his family, we receive our recipients of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. These are all the things working in our favor, but there is still a law of sin and death working in our members. The imperfection of that image of Christ in the Christian life comes completely from the corruptness of our old nature. It is not from an insufficiency of Christ. It is not that he has not done enough. We cannot look at him and say, well, you know, I needed more strength and he didn't give it. No, it's that we yield ourselves to the flesh. We do not flee youthful lusts as Paul instructed Timothy. And all of this conflict weakens our faith, hinders our knowledge, throws water on our zeal, and produces a distress mentally and emotionally of the Christian life. Sadly, there are some who seem not to struggle at all which is not an evidence of spirituality. It's more, it's more an evidence of simply yielding to the flesh and just giving in and saying, well, these things, I don't think they're that important. They've, they've surrendered already. The source then, what is the source of our hope? Uh, we need to turn a corner because... With these two laws, if we're not careful, we get hung up on the first law and we almost stop there and use it as an excuse. Well, there is deliverance from this law of sin working in our members. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Verse 24, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> now, you might stop there and you might think, well, that means that we're good as soon as we see him. Till then, no sense worrying about it. But when we see him, that's when our victory comes. But he doesn't say, he doesn't write this as if it is something to be hoped for, looked for in the future, <clears throat> but rather in the present, he says, I, so with, I, with my mind, I serve the law Myself, I myself serve the law of God with the flesh, law of sin, as if, as if it's almost giving in or yielding, but we know he's not doing that because the very next thing he says is, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of, of spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Hey, there's victory in Jesus Christ from the law of sin. We are no longer bound by it. Why? Christian liberty. That's the answer. We again, we keep thinking that liberty is on this end so I can just live like I want to live. No, it's on this end that sets me free from the law of sin and death where I do not have to do it anymore. So... What the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law <clears throat> might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And it, and it goes on and talks about those that walk after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, those that walk after the spirit after the things of the spirit. Let me try to say it in this way. 
Our deliverance comes through the finished work of Jesus Christ. The same, <clears throat> the same sacrifice that secures our eternal salvation also gives us strength to live day by day. That's why the Bible doesn't say that we're saved by faith, but it also says the just shall live by faith. Man who has nothing uh, to oppose the temptation but the power of his will or the fear of consequences is like a man walking on thin ice. If all you have to try to compel you to do right is the power of your own wills and, you know, the little train that could Christianity, right? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. If that's all you have, or if all you have is, well, I don't want to do wrong because of the consequences of sin. And that is true. That is true. But if that's all you have, you're walking on thin ice. Because there comes a day when our flesh wants sin more than we want to avoid it. But that's not all we have if we're a child of God. What we have is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What we have are the instructions of God's Word. What we have is our position in Jesus Christ. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Or in fact, you are free in fact. This deliverance is a continuing work of God's grace. We're almost done. It's a continuing work of God's grace in the life of the believer. Where we continue to learn to walk in the Spirit. We continue to learn to say no to the flesh. We continue to be a, become aware of sins working in us. What we used to ignore or be unaware of, we now start to see the law of sin working in our members and against us. We start to see, you know, where we thought we were justified thinking something critical of another child of God. Now we see it as a lack of love, a lack of understanding, a lack of spiritual discernment. What's going on? Uh, the, spirit of, the Spirit is continually being brought to understand God's law. Because it's, it's the same awareness that Jesus brings as he preaches the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you've heard it said, thou shalt not, but I say unto you. And he talks about the spirit of the law. And as we walk in the spirit, we begin, we begin to come, become aware of the spirit of the law. The reason that God gave the commandment <clears throat> was not so that we would just have a list of affirmative uh, do's and don'ts, but so that we might see the character and nature of God reflected in those laws and desire to be like him. This deliverance is promised to us through Jesus Christ, and in no other way can deliverance from the power of sin be achieved. <clears throat> Christianity then finds... An infinite evil, but pr proposes an infinite remedy. In other words, as we walk in the Spirit. A couple of times in this passage, it mentions walking in the Spirit. For those who walk <clears throat> after the Spirit, in verse number 1 of chapter 8. No, not according, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Um, in uh, verse number four of chapter eight, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Let me, let me start bringing the, the corners of the net up. <clears throat> when, the, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he's God in the flesh, amen? The Bible says he didn't come to destroy the law. He came and fulfilled the law. The law was to point to Jesus Christ. It does so in two ways. It does so because, and we know that the law uh, was given because of transgression, right? Because of sin. So it points us to Christ in two ways. Number one, it shows our, us 
that we are not capable of, re, of measuring up to God's standard of holiness. And so it, it makes us look for another remedy. But it also points us to Christ in this, that Jesus Christ came and examined him by the law of God. And you find him without fault. The law which reveals the righteousness of God shows that that righteousness is is available in Jesus Christ, that he is the righteousness of God. So it points to him in that man examined him like they would look over a potential Passover lamb to look for faults, to look for flaws, to look for lameness or blindness or any such thing. And examining Jesus Christ by the holy law of God, they find no fault in him, declared so. I find no fault in him. What did they say? We can't find anything wrong with him unless unless we can accuse him of blasphemy. In other words... The only chance we have is by maintaining that he is not God in the flesh. That he's not who he said he is. And of course we know that he was and is. But notice this also. The Bible talks about that through salvation, the righteousness of the law which condemns sin. The righteousness of the law which reveals Jesus Christ. The righteousness of the law is, can be fulfilled in us as we walk, after, walk in the Spirit and not after the flesh. What does that mean? That as we gain victory in our life, the righteousness which the law reveals is now being able to be reflected in our lives to begin to live after the commandments of God is to reflect the very nature and attributes of God himself that doesn't mean that we become omniscient or omnipresent but we can imitate and mirror God's love God's holiness God's justice those communicable, those transferable attributes of God. And those are available to us and, re, and the righteousness which is bound or defined in the law. <clears throat> Think about what the law did. The law established a standard of righteousness. Those standards of righteousness can become revealed in us as we walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. It is, so we see that the Christian is better known by what he would be than what he has been. If the progress in the Christian life is as it ought to be, then we are progressing, growing stronger, more separated, more uh, aware of God's holiness and trying to be that way. The best of men have nothing to be proud of because everything we touch is made dirty by our touch, right? Uh, Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But his righteousness revealed in us is a whole different matter because that's the righteousness of God. Since... We have no perfection in ourselves. We can be thankful that we have perfection available to us in Jesus Christ. By that, I, mean, I do not mean sinless on this, in this world, but rather I do mean maturity in Christ. And we see the difference also between hypocrisy of trying to act as though you are something you're not and the real Christian life which struggles but makes progress toward the ideal that God has established. Sin 
needs the consent of the will in, in our lives or it cannot, uh, it cannot win. It must have the consent of our will. It's no wonder that this is described by Paul in such, such personal terms. I will say this in conclusion as, as we were singing tonight, as Brother Matt was uh, giving us the challenge from our scripture reading for this week, and as I'm thinking about what Paul had said, I was thinking about this comparison. The comparison of Paul before the law, of thinking that he was okay. Compared to after the, after the law comes, realizing his desperate condition so that he might trust Jesus Christ. But that confidence in Christ brings an, an awareness and a knowledge. I, uh, some years ago when I produced that that uh, article and CD of t- called 10 Minutes to Peace or The Biblical Path to Peace. I remember I made the point and it got brought up. I was trying to give some advice to a pastor friend here a week ago and he was asking about this and trying to figure out the best way to balance these things out. And I was reminded of where Jesus said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The contrast between the peace that the world gives and the peace that God gives. And how does the world try to give you peace? The world tries to give you peace by ignoring the problem. There's There's no heaven and no hell. God, a loving God, wouldn't send people to hell. And so there's nothing to worry about. And so just, you know, just live and let live. It tries to give you peace by trying to convince you there is no danger. God, on the other hand, gives you peace by giving you the answer to the problem. Salvation through Jesus Christ. Which would I rather have? Thinking I'm okay or having come to the realization that I'm a sinner and trusting Jesus Christ and recognizing that in him we are accepted in the beloved to know that I am okay because of Christ. Which would I rather have? Which would I rather have? The complicity with sin, just the the law of sin in my members that Paul said, hey, before the law came, you know, I felt like I was alive. He was complicit with his sin. He was in agreement with his sin. He was a participant in his sin. But the law of God came and revealed his sin. Sin revived. I died. But, it, but he goes on to give us a perspective that that's what caused him to come to Jesus Christ. So which would I rather have? Being complicit with my sin, being in agreement with my sin, or having the conflict between the flesh and the spirit with the promise of victory through Jesus Christ. It's not just, well, I can be you know, easy, easy, does it steady as she goes or have conflict? No, it's conflict with a promise of victory through Jesus Christ. Well, obviously the answers are I'd rather know the truth and be set free by the truth. I'd rather have the promise of God to get victory in my time of conflict. Someone said this, Where there is sincerity of heart, obedience will follow. Where there is sincerity of heart, obedience will follow. The glory of the gospel revelation is that God 
by implanting this principle in the souls of those that are saved gives power to the Christian to do all that God's word requires because we are no longer under the law of sin and death. We are no longer struggling to try to earn our salvation. We rather are set free from the law of sin that we might serve uh, the God who loves us. And so the law of sin is condemned in the flesh. Notice in, uh, in verse number uh, 3 of Romans chapter number, uh, excuse me, verse number 2 of chapter 8 of the book of Romans. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. That is Christian liberty. That is Christian liberty. I, I hope it is, it is becoming more in focus for me this month. Exactly what Christian, how to, we all say, oh, I understand Christian liberty. But when you are put in a position to have to define it, have to explain it, have to write a paper on it, right? When you're put in that position, you start to actually formalize your thoughts on it and be able to get clarity on it. It's the t difference between having a basic understanding of it and being able to explain it. And this focus on Christian liberty is helping me to gain clarity on the way, best way, the Bible way to explain it because the Bible is the best dictionary on the Bible. What is the best way to understand Christian liberty? Is that we are set free from the law of sin and death. Free to what? Free to serve another because the first husband is dead. Free to what? Free to observe the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Uh, and here, this law of the inward man, the law of God after the inward man. The individual then, uh, excuse me, the commands of the New Testament are repent, believe, love, serve, worship God, and praise Him. When we do those things, we are doing the Christian work, the work that God wants of us, expects of us. These things are walking in the Spirit. Father, I pray that you would help us, that we might even more fully rejoice because we more deeply understand what is ours in Christ. It is, no, it is no yielding to a constant conflict between the law of sin and the law of God that Paul is describing. He is saying there is a battle, but there is victory in Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would help us to accept and claim such victory. Maybe tonight there are those here who who become, need to become more aware of the working of sin in their life, to recognize it so they, they might ask and receive God's help in defeating and overcoming it. And God, that we might walk in the Spirit, and therefore, as the Bible says, if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God, I pray it would be so that, as it says there in Galatians, that we would walk in the Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. With our heads bowed and our eyes.